Hey guys, uh, today's lecture is on balance. Uh, I love balance, honestly, because everything connects to it. Uh, I think a lot of times it gets compartmentalized as its own thing, when really from posture all the way down to you know the central nervous system, it's really helping us to maintain our balance. So um, yeah, any deviations in any of those things starts to throw it off. So really uh, a lack of balance can really show you that there is some type of impairment somewhere along the chain. Uh, and I hope that we can get enough of the basics down to understand that complexity. And then eventually in a neuromuscular uh, re-education class, really, really dive in even harder to what's happening um, with balance. So let's get right in on this. So balance, uh, two things we need to understand about the definition of balance. We have two uh, parameters to think about. One is the center of mass. And this is the center of the mass of the body. So the point at which all parts from there are equal mass wise. So let's go back and look at our plumb line over here. I want to point out right here, the second sacral vertebrae, that the plumb line or line of gravity falls directly anterior to the second sacral vertebrae. That is our center of mass or center of gravity. That will change Whoa, that can change S2, just anterior to that. Say someone's had uh, an amputation, that's gonna significantly change the center of mass for that person. The second thing is the base of support, BOS, base of support. And this is the perimeter of contact. So let's go over here. So if I'm standing, circles or ovals are gonna represent my feet like this my base of support is that area. If I stand tandem, my base of support is a little smaller and it's narrow. So it's, the, having this is going to challenge us in different ways. Uh, I could stand with my feet really wide, wide-legged stance. You'll see this with a lot of um, issues with the cerebellum and balance disorders. The patient's gonna start to widen uh, their gait and their stance. Uh, to help with balance. So those are some examples there. Now I want to think about sitting, okay? So with sitting, I think S2 is, anterior to S2 is still our center of gravity. So if I'm sitting in a chair, there's my glutes, there's my legs out to my knees. I know this is super crude, but you get the idea. My center of gravity is here, closer to the back of the chair, closer to where I'm at which is what allows us to actually lean forward quite a bit, okay? So you see our perimeter here, pretty wide. So balance is the ability to maintain your center of gravity or center of mass within the base of support. So I hear a lot of people say, um, you know, to maintain balance or for balance to be dynamic, you have to move outside the base of support. That's actually incorrect. If you move outside the base of support, you're going to fall or you're gonna to have to use different strategies that your body already has integrated into it to regain your balance, to regain that center of gravity um, or center of mass within the base of support. So let's make sure that's clear on that. Balance is the ability to maintain the center of gravity within the base of support not moving outside the base support. That is falling, for sure. So we have our two definition, or two parameters to make our definition. Now we have two types of balance. We have static balance, and we have dynamic balance. Static balance, simply put, no movement. The center of gravity, or center of mass, think of a golf ball sitting right in front of the S2, is not moving. If I sit perfectly stationary, and all of this is with the assumption that I don't, I'm not leaning on an armrest or leaning back in a chair, right? So that's static. Now, if I move my arms, is that still static balance? Absolutely, because my center of gravity is not moving, okay? Pretty easy. Dynamic balance. There's movement of the center of gravity within the base support. So if I'm sitting here and I'm leaning forward, leaning back, leaning to the side, that's gonna change my um, or make my center of mass have to move. Also rotation, that golf ball's moving, doesn't have to move up, down, left, and right, it can just be rotating, not as a motion. So that is also dynamic. 
okay? Getting up out of a chair, rising up on your heels. If that golf ball is moving in any capacity, that's dynamic balance. There's a second way, and that's with a, if you're standing or sitting on, oops, you can't really see that one, the green writing, a compliant surface. So say a BOSU ball that moves all over the place or a foam pad, something that's not a firm surface, okay? Even if I'm trying to stay stationary, but I'm sitting on a foam pad, I'm on a compliant surface, automatically dynamic balance. So those are our two balances, static and dynamic. We can apply those to a multitude of postures. Now you can see in the notes here, I'm talking, I got some words like quadruped here. Don't worry about those, okay? Those are different postures. For today, we're gonna look at sitting and standing as our two postures to focus on. So before we get into grading balance, we now know what the definition of a balance is and the types of balance. Let's look at things that influence our balance. Oops, I don't wanna cross it out. And this, hopefully, quick look is going to show you um, why balance is so complex. So first, let's look at the sensory. A lot of times, uh, therapists are doing sensory tests, so we don't really look at the eyes, of course, necessarily, but you can. We can absolutely see if someone has um, a good visual acuity. If someone's blind or they're not wearing their glasses, that's going to decrease their balance. Isn't one of the things you do when you stand on one leg is focus on a part of the wall? Exactly. You're using your eyes to see where something is, and if it moves, your brain's like, oh, I need to go back this way. Proprioception, that's a big one. We'll talk way more about this in neurological lectures, but that's just your ability of the joint to know where it is in space. So if you start to lean forward, your body knows, oh, my joints are moving that way, so I need to pull back. Then you have the vestibular system. I'm gonna bring it out in red. You can't do anything to eliminate the vestibular system. We can encourage more use of it, like closing your eyes, right? Um, but we can't fully get rid of it uh, like we can by closing our eyes. And this is in the uh, cochlear part of your ear, where, or the, um, the canals of your ear, I'm sorry, where uh, your body is able to tell where you are in space. So you close your eyes, you can tell that your head is, or your body is moving left or right, okay? You have that sensation. If someone has a vestibular issue, you're not gonna be able to take that out. You're gonna have to fix the vestibular issue if you want to work on their balance. So I would highly recommend specializing in some vestibular treatment. Pretty awesome thing. Then we go down to posture. If your posture is poor, that's gonna throw off your balance. Range of motion. Uh, if you're really stiff, lacking range of motion or poor range of motion can contribute to poor posture. Neuromuscular control, just the ability to literally control the way your body moves. Again, this is something we'll talk more about in neuromuscular rehabilitation, but uh, neuromuscular control is vitally important. Overall strength and endurance. Of course, that's gonna be important. That's what most people think of when they think of therapy. Tone and synergies, it's another neurological uh, piece of what we're looking at here, uh, but that's gonna throw things off. So all of those things, and then within those things, there's multitudes of things. All of those things have to work um, pretty much at 100% efficiency to have the best balance possible. Any deviation in any of these sections is going to start to throw off balance, or other systems are going to have to compensate and pick up for the slack, okay? So those are our influences. Now let's get into strategies and then we'll get into grading. So there's three strategies here. The first strategy is the ankle strategy, and that's for small adjustments. So what I want you to think about is the word perturbations. Perturbation is any outside force. So if I'm standing and you push on me, that's an outside force. So what corrects a small push? My ankles are gonna correct a small force. Front to back, medial lateral, we need to understand the muscles that do that, but um, for right now, just understand the ankle is going to help make those adjustments. Um, and then the hip, so we have the ankle, then we have the hip large adjustments. If you push me from behind uh, slightly, uh, my ankles are correct, you push me hard, my hip's gonna flex and my hip's gonna have to try to save me, right? Hip is gonna be for large adjustments. And then the one that's not on here and often overlooked is the step strategy. If you push me hard enough and I start to fall forward, what's gonna happen to keep me from falling? I'm either gonna fall face first or I'm going to take a step and save myself. 
I have moved my base of support anterior, thus maintained my center of mass in my base of support, thus I'm not falling. All right? And then I want us to think about this because the next lecture in this series is going to be on gait. What, what do we call when you move your foot forward? A step. So what is gait really? If you really simplify gait, gait is really a constant step strategy. As we're dynamically moving our center of mass forward, we are constantly doing step strategies the whole way to keep from falling forward. I think it's pretty cool. So let's get over to grading. How are we gonna grade balance? Well, honestly, there's a lot of good objective measures I'll show you in a minute, but this is a way therapists do to just have a general ballpark idea. And that's why I wrote this on here. This is simply an assessment to give you a baseline. That is it. And as we go through this, you'll see how unbelievably subjective it can be. So um, it's hard to see big gains in the changes here, and it's not a good way to document true progress on a, more, on a smaller level, and definitely not for anything exact. With this, you're taking into consideration maybe patient age and ability levels and things like this. Whereas something like over here, Let's get back to the more objective assessments, dynamic gate index. I mean, there's a specific handout and a way to score those things. Uh, the Berg balance, the functional reach, the timed up and go, uh, Tanetti's test. Uh, there's a lot of different actual objective assessments. But to start with balance, let's stay basic. So we have our two types of balance and we have four grades. So we have static and dynamic. And we're gonna look at sitting and standing. When we look at seated posture or a seated balance, it's assumed that the feet are on the floor. Obviously, though, if you lift a patient up on a table higher and their feet aren't on the floor, we need to reassess their balance because we've totally changed the size of their base of support. And of course, standing is just standing. So when I say feet on the floor unsupported, that means I'm not leaning against a part of a chair. Okay? So keep that in mind as we're going through these balance grades. So now, static standing seated it doesn't matter static balance poor balance therapist has to use their hands to keep the patient up so even if the patient's holding on to a bar and they're fall they're falling even if they're holding on to something that is poor if you have as a therapist to put your hands on the patient fair patient uses their hands so if i'm seated and I'm just sitting here and I have to keep a hand on the chair. That makes me fair, static, seated balance. Good is going to be, now there's a couple different ways to say this. Some people say there's not a challenge depending on what your instructor says, but I would say we could probably do this by saying there's a moderate to minimal sway. So take me seated in the chair, trying to stay seated I shouldn't be moving like this, but I'm not falling and I don't need my hands. So this is some sway. So this is good balance. It's not normal though. Normal, of course, <laughs> would look normal and I should be able to be like a statue. Okay. Now we move to dynamic. Dynamic poor. This is a little change from the other side. The patient uses their hands. So if I have to put my hands on my knees to lean forward, because that's dynamic, that makes me poor dynamic. If I need to use a walker to walk, because walking is dynamic, then I also would be poor dynamic balance. Okay? Fair. And this is where it's super subjective. A min, whoops. I'm gonna go ahead and write these in. And this is where serious subjectivity comes in, in this dynamic aspect for fair, good, and normal. So. In FAIR, the patient accepts a minimal challenge. Well, what's a minimal challenge to the patient? What's a minimal challenge to me is gonna to be totally different than a minimal challenge to an amputee with Parkinson's who's 85, right? Totally different. So this is where it gets kind of subjective. But at least the main thing we know is we don't need to put any hands on the patient. They should be able to be um, independent or standby assist, right? At least for very basic things. So. Uh, min balance or uh, fair balance is a accepting a minimal challenge. What that is again, very subjective. Good, accept a moderate balance. Normal, accept a maximal challenge. I would say for me, um, as a, I would say decently fit 38 year old, I should be able to stand on one leg and reach out really far. 
for dynamic balance, at least that, okay? So that's how we grade our balance for a general assessment. So if you're, you know, you're walking by a therapist, you're talking to someone and you're like, hey, how's, you know, how's Jim's balance? And your fellow therapist says, oh, he is dynamic, he's modest, or he's, um, he has moderate dynamic standing balance. Oh, that's great, that means he can walk without a walker and accept some challenges, right? So it just gives you an idea of what's going on if you have that, but in no way is it the best objective way to measure progress. That's why we have, like I said, a host of other tests that we can look at here. So, and that concludes our brief lecture on basic aspects of balance. So we should be able to know how to grade balance. We should understand the influence of balance uh, and how to define balance and understanding what the center of mass and its movement or not does to our balance. So you can get through all the other stuff so we can do fun stuff.